Hello, mathematicians. My name is Matt DeSorbo. I'll be doing the algebra lessons for Skew the Script. Today, we have a lesson for you on correlation and causation, and specifically how it relates to performance and attendance in schools. So without further ado, let's skew it. Welcome in to lesson 2.4 for Skew the Script. Today, we'll be talking about correlation and causation. Specifically, we'll be discussing education, which can often be a challenge for low-income students, sort of a balancing act, making sure to pay rent, health insurance, putting food on the table, working side jobs. It can be difficult, and our main question today will be if schools in America effectively and successfully equalize opportunity for low-income students. Specifically, we'll be thinking about this through the window of attendance, and our key analysis today will be if raising attendance will also raise scores for low-income students. If you'd like to follow along, you can check out the link below, download or print our guided notes and work through them as we talk through the video. Our first main topic of the day will be the correlation coefficient. Um, very simple definition, but some hidden complexities as we'll see. It measures the strength and direction of the relationship between two variables. So both strength and direction, which we'll explore further now. Here we have a bunch of different scatter plots all the way on the left. Um, the most extreme po perfect positive correlation all the way on the right, a perfect negative correlation and all sorts of correlations in between. A positive correlation, simply put, is when the X value increases, the Y value also will tend to increase. So as X goes up, Y will tend to go up. For example, for a perfect positive correlation, we see X increasing and Y increasing. And we see for both the strong and weak and any sort of positive correlation, when X increases, Y will also tend to increase. Uh, on the flip side, a negative correlation is as the X values increase, the Y values will tend to decrease. So for perfect negative correlation, as X increases, the Y will decrease. And for both weak, strong, and any sort of negative correlation, as X increases, Y will tend to decrease. We can draw what we call a line of best fit, this black line that kind of goes to the center of the data. And what's a neat little trick to remember uh, what correlation is which. Uh, for positive correlations, the line of best fit will have a positive slope. And for negative correlations, uh, the line of best fit will have a negative slope. A quick review on this line of best fit. You can think of it as a straight line that roughly kind of centers your data. Half of the data will be above and half of the data will be below it. That's kind of a, not a great definition, but don't worry. You'll see it more formally when you take your first statistics course. You will learn all about it. Um, for now, you can just think of it as modeling the trend of the data. It's not just connecting uh, the dots. So we talked about direction. Um, X, as X increases, if Y, it tends to go up or down. Now let's talk about strength, the second component of correlation. Again, we'll draw our line of best fit in these charts. Um, for strong correlations, either positive or negative, the data will be close to the line of best fit. So you can see here for the either perfect or strong, both positive and negative correlations, we've drawn this sort of uh, blue band around the lines of best fit. The data is generally close to the lines of best fit. So the black line, line of best fit, is a good model for the data. If we use it to make predictions, we're going to make pretty solid and close predictions uh, for the data. On the flip side, weak correlations are not necessarily close to the line of best fit. The data can actually be quite far. So for the, both the weak positive and negative correlations, um, you can see that the points kind of splay out farther from the line than we would want. Uh, and we like to think of this as a meh model for the data. If you use the line to make a prediction, you might be uh, quite, uh, quite a ways off from the actual value. Um, this all boils down to what we call the correlation coefficient, which we uh, say is R. And it's a number between negative one and one that's inclusive. So it can be negative one and it can be one. It tells you both the strength and direction of a correlation. So you can see uh, we assign our cor correlation values to all these different charts. Um, on the left side, we have perfect positive correlation, R equals one. On the right side, perfect negative correlation, R equals negative one, and all sorts of value in between. Remember, when R is greater than zero, as you can see, the uh, slope of the line of best fit is positive, and vice versa when R is less than zero. You can also see when R is close, when R is large in magnitude, so either close to one or close to negative one, the points are far closer to the line of best fit. So uh, kind of just re rehashing what I just said, a quick guide when you have a negative R value, negative correlation, flip when you have a positive R value, and when R is close to zero, you have a weak correlation, and when R is close to either negative one or one, you have a strong correlation. So let's turn to correlation and linearity, which is a deceptively interesting topic. This is a very famous data set called Anscombe's Quartet. 
Um, you see four different data sets plotted here. They all look super different. You have different X values and Y values. What do they have in common? Surprisingly, they all have the same correlation of 0.67. How could that be? These data sets look completely different. Their shapes could not be more different. Each one is so um, distinct from the other. Um, that's because correlation co the correlation coefficient R is best used for linear relationships. So something like the top left uh, chart we see here in Anscombe's Quartet. It can be distorted and sort of messed up by curvy shapes or outliers. You see an outlier on the kind of the bottom uh, two charts. So unfortunately, correlation is sort of restricted to these linear relationships. Otherwise, you can get some, some strange results. Let's turn to our final topic, correlation versus causation. And this actually brings us to our discussion section for the day. So we're going to start by discussing the income achievement gap. And you can see here uh, sort of a chart. The y-axis is scores on a standardized exam. The different bars represent students in blue that are eligible for free or reduced price lunch, whereas students in orange are not eligible for free or reduced price lunch. Um, and we see here a result that's reflected nationally. Low-income students, on average, perform worse on math exams than middle or upper class students. And again, this is on average aggregating uh, the data, we're going to be defining this as the income achievement gap. And uh, we can also note that there is an income attendance gap. So here's a chart of New York, um, uh, New York City. The areas that are more red are the areas where students are more frequently absent from school. And again, this reflects a, a trend we see nationally. Low income areas tend to have more chronically absent students. So wait a second, that sounds like a correlation. Low income areas, have low absentee students, but or, or high absent, sorry, low income areas have high absentee uh, students, but also have uh, low uh, uh, test scores. So this sounds like something that we can dive into. There's a lot of discussion around this. Um, and one idea that sort of comes to the fore is that a way to close the achievement gap um, for low income students on test scores is to reduce the attendance gap. So the idea here is that we build this model where we say poverty is sort of feeding into low attendance, which is then feeding into low scores. And one potential solution is to ignore the input of poverty and just fix the attendance, say we're going to mandate that attendance be high, and then hopefully that will lead to high scores. So our main question is, will raising attendance actually also raise the test scores? So we can look at this with a linear regression, which we'll learn more about later in the skew script universe. This is data from a random sample of Texas high school students. The X value is the percent attendance, and the Y value is their score on a standardized test. Again, the X is the explanatory, and the Y is the response variable. Input uh, is another way to say it. X value is attendance, and Y is our test scores. We can plot these on a line, and uh, you're probably thinking what I'm thinking. The line of best fit is super close to the data, and this is clearly a strong and positive correlation. The X axis is percent um, attendance and the y-axis is uh, test scores. And this is something we see across the country. Students who attend school more often also tend to have a higher uh, academic achievement. So there's a clear correlation here, strong and positive correlation. So superintendents see this data and they say, huh, well, if we fix attendance, that must fix test scores. So let's focus on that. They rolled out a bunch of policies. Some cost quite a pretty penny uh, to try to improve attendance. A couple of ways they did that was call programs, so calling students that are chronically absent, hiring case managers and coordinators to sort of work on the problem, and in even some examples using Uber and Lyft for students that have transportation issues getting to school. And the result in terms of attendance was great. As time went on, attendance got better. However, for scores, the result was not so great. As time went on, scores stayed flat. There was no increase, no significant rise in test scores, and the achievement gaps remained. So what's going on here? We have this model where we think of poverty, feeding into low attendance, feeding into low scores. Well, we fixed, the superintendents fixed the low attendance, they made it high attendance, but they didn't see the high scores flowing through. So our discussion, our, our discussion question today is, why didn't raising attendance work? Something for you to discuss with your class. And we'll see you next time on Student Script. <laughs>